Um, I'm really excited about the guest that we have on the line, Dre. I've been trying to um, interview this dude for a minute now. I've been following his his movement uh, for a little minute now. And what got me into it was because, Dre, you know, for three years I had a show called The Uncle Tom Show. Oh, yeah. Where I shared it, my views. It was very popular. It was it was very popular, thankfully. But um, I ended up, you know, uh, abandoning ship on The Uncle Tom Show. Because I got too much hate. And is, that what you, is that what it officially was? You know, you when, it, when I look back at it, yeah, we're living in a society where people are just pussies. And, and I just couldn't deal with the, the, the doxing and the this and the that. And I was doxing just, serious. Doxing I is never really approve of doxing serious. of anybody. Nah, Nobody. nah, doxing is bullshit. But I came across this dude who was carrying the torch. Okay. If I should say, um, definitely a, a, a very intelligent cat. I had a chance to check out some of his videos, and I'm excited to introduce him to Super Audio Network, ladies and gentlemen. On the line, Mr. Charleston White. What up, man? How y'all doing, man? We doing good, man. Doing good out here in California, and you're calling from Fort Worth, Texas, right? Yeah, yeah, Fort Worth, Dallas, Fort Worth area metropolitan. Yes, yes, yes. Well, shit, I want to get, uh, I want to jump into it, man. I want to, uh, you know, maybe later on we'll talk a little bit of the current events and things like that. But I would love to, you know, get to know you first. I understand your uncle was a pimp. Yeah, man. Uh, my uncle Wayne, which was my mom's oldest brother, uh, when I was born, I think probably about 1976 or early 1977, there was a movie uh, that came out that was called Comeback Charleston Blue. Uh, my dad name is Charles. A uh, mom named me Charleston. So when I come home from the hospital, uh, you know, Unc's lifestyle, he's the only boy uh, amongst three girls, and he's the oldest. And so, uh, you know, that was his favorite movie. Uh, he gave me that name, Blue, Charleston Blue. And so it kind of it kind of stuck with me uh, throughout life. Uh, I grew up under, uh, you know, my first five, six, seven years of life, man, uh, you know, there's a lot of exposure to Uncle Wayne. Uh, my mother was a teenage mother. She had my brother at 15, had me at 17. Uh, my dad, my dad was a square guy, right? He was a square nigga. He went, he went to the Navy, uh, and then he got a job uh, working within government. Uh, my mother was a teenage mother with a lot of ambition, uh, and so she landed a job at General Motors in the early 80s, uh, 81, 82. Oh, the good years. So. Yeah, yeah, and so and so our lives kind of went uh, from rags to riches, uh, seemingly like 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 overnight for me because I was so young. Uh, but Uncle Wayne was a very pivotal uh, a male figure growing up because he was mom's only brother. Uh, my granddad, my granddad owned a barber shop over on the south side of Fort Worth uh, in a in a very uh, over off Allen and Hattie and Betsy, and, and if anybody from Fort Worth, they know what I'm talking about. And so the name of the barber shop was called Chopping Block, and everybody hustled outside and around that barber shop. And so I was always able to go and sit around other men and see the early hustlers from the the, the, the late '70s, the early '80s. Uh, I got to see uh, the guys who pushed the crack uh, out into the streets. I got to see my my, my granddad also. Uh, he, he worked at the bus born, which the bus born, you know, that's the buses for the schools. So he had all the women at the bus born. Uh, you know, he had some selling pussy. He had some boosting clothes. Uh, so both my granddad and both my uncle, man, was real good with ladies. Uh, my mother, uh, my mother is a very uh, a strong black woman uh, uh, who's highly respected in the streets as well. My grandfather. Uh, is one of the founders and one of the originals of, of, of this big, back then, it, it, it was like a social club. It's called the Dappers. And okay. it was a bunch of, you know, dapper gentlemen who dressed mm -hmm. real, real well. Uh, and so my, my, and so I come from dapper men. I come from men uh, uh, who pimped. The, the, the significance about my uncle was uh, he was what they would call a gorilla pimp. He was very abusive. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he beat women. And so... I grew up believing uh, that some of his prostitutes uh, were my aunts. You know how they, they say that's your auntie, that's your aunt Sharon. They didn't say that's his hoe, they say that's your auntie. Mm -hmm. So I grew up seeing them as aunts, right? So when I wake up uh, at night, uh, mom mom got a room for, you know, her big brother. He coming through with trash bags full of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got to see uh, uh, things that, that most children, you know, shouldn't see early on. 
uh, waking up in the middle of the night, man, hearing my uncle uh, jump on who I thought at the time was my Aunt Sharon mm. uh, and having to go to school two, three hours later, mm. uh, seeing her with the black eye. Uh, you, you learn to either become that kind of person or, or you learn to defy being that kind of person, man. And so growing up around women, uh, I never wanted to be the one to inflict the pain. Mm. Uh, so I never vowed to be the one to slap around. And, and, and my uncle was vicious, man. Uh, he'll beat her in a minute. Mm. Uh, but it also uh, left a certain fact, uh, a, a factor of intimidation that I had toward my uncle where uh, I couldn't, you know, that's a side that, that prevents you from bonding, uh, man, with your dad or with your uncle or, or whomever, whomever you see uh, abusing people. And so I saw that growing up, man. And I had an older brother. Mm -hmm. uh, he nor I never been spanked by a man. Uh, we never been disciplined by a man. Uh, we always got to see the negative elements. Uh, the drunk man, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the hustler man, uh, the wife beater, the woman beater, the cheat man. So we never saw the doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, we never saw the lawyers. We never saw the faithful husbands. Uh, I never seen a man get up and go to work. Uh, all I ever seen was mom get up and go to work. So growing up in, in, in my young and in, in, in impressionable mind, I, I didn't know men work because I'd never seen a man get up and go to work. Wow. Damn. Oh, um, yeah, that's that's deep. Um, that's 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 deep. Uh, you know, I had my mother. She was she was very loving, uh, very, you know, very nurturing. Uh, she 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 was a woman that had a moral compass. Right. So she didn't lie. Mm -hmm. uh, she taught us to do right because right is the right thing to do. Uh, she never condoned. She never condoned our wrongdoings. Uh, so she tried to teach us right. But because, you know, man, the, the negative elements uh, that you see from your culture, uh, your your mom's brothers, your mom's cousins, uh, spending the night over your homeboy's houses. So all the, the, the negative elements that you get exposed to. And, and, and you don't have anything to correct it. You don't have anything to rebut it. Yeah. You don't have anything to compare to, right? So you embrace it. When you cut on the television, the television propagates what we see in, in our homes, right? If, if we oh, watch yeah. a good movie, if we watch a good good, good show on TV, man, we go see a nigga that kick a bitch ass, right? Mm -hmm. We know an uncle that kick a woman. We got we got homeboys who, who, who jump on women. But we don't say anything. Uh, you hear it in gangster but, rap. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's so it's propagated in in television through imagery through sight, mm -hmm. and then it's solidified through the music. So as a as a kid, man, you see Uncle Uncle Joe, he whoop women. Uh, Uncle Uncle Wayne, he whoop women. Uh, Mom's cousin Jeffrey Naki, they whoop women. Uh, you never see a man that's faithful to a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, every, so you see what I'm saying? So yeah, and, and, all the negative you know, shit. Yeah, homie, I get, I get all the negative shit. And so, but and mom is trying to teach us this. Boy, where you get this from? Oh, this girl bought it for me. Uh, boy, give it back to her. So you you know, mom is saying things like, if you go over a woman's house, this is what mom's trying to teach a nigga. If you mm -hmm. go over a woman's house and you open her ice box, you've used electricity. If you grab her remote and start flicking the television, punching on buttons with the remote, you using electricity. If you go in there and pee in her bathroom and flush her toilet, you done use some water. So you less than a man, son. If you go over there and you sleeping with that woman, you can't help help that woman in those areas. That's an interesting uh, point of view. So that's that's what mom is saying, right? Trying to teach us yeah. not to be the type of niggas for one to be sorry and lazy and to and to be dependent upon women on but the you're, flip hand you're doing what we you send, go ahead no no go ahead uh on, on the flip end you hearing all the bullshit from the men exactly. from the players the gigolos the max uh and and it's counterproductive to what mom is teaching yeah and so as a boy i'm saying yeah mom i hear what you saying but i need to identify with a man i need a man to reiterate what mom is saying so what mom is saying falls on deaf ears because I got the man that I see and then I got the music that I hear and I got the movies that I watch to make mom say, no, nah, I don't want what mama, what mama talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this life is a little more interesting over here. Yeah. 
every man uh falls in my immediate family uh has gone to prison damn yep so so with that aspect uh you, you start noticing these things when you become say pre-adolescent right mm -hmm. 11 12 13 14 you starting to you can start you can start to decipher and, and kind of make more of an understanding of what grown folks is saying. Mm -hmm. You start realizing that that ain't B went to jail for for stealing. You start realizing who who mama and you you know what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. you can start rationalization because of brain de development at that stage. So pre adolescence is 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 normally when when the teens start getting a smart mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, peer pressure and and what your friends think starts to become. Uh, a, a, a greater role than what your parents say to do. Mm -hmm. So you start kind of what they say, smelling your piss, right? Yeah. So by the time I get to adolescence, uh, just about every man in the family done gone to prison. You got the crack era, right? Mm. Oh, so man. as they as, as they coming back from prison, nobody's saying nothing bad about prison. Man, that's All, just fun, yo. You, you, hey, it, it, it's almost a badge of honor say it ain't no almost yeah it, it is. is and they they get it celebrated more be. they get celebrated more when when they get home too you know what I'm say saying? that I, I i'm about to take you to that so as a kid we we see that i noticed i noticed how the family treated uncle wayne uncle wayne pull up in that rolls royce he go have them suits on he got them pretty high yellow women man everybody and and he got the briefcase with the money in it with the gold chain I'm seeing it, how when he come around, how the other family members and everybody in the community responds to him mm -hmm. compared to how they respond to Uncle Curtis, who's struggling to keep the blue collar job. Yeah. Or, so we yeah. as kids, we see how they treat the dope dealing uncles compared to the uncle that, that, that ain't be kicking the ass. So. You start taking note of what kind of man you want to be early on as a boy. So if you don't never get to see no man, what characteristics and what traits do you begin to take on as a boy? The shit you see on television. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So as, as a kid, so I'm 12, 11, 12. I'm noticing the difference between high school party, high school graduation parties, and welcome home prison parties. A big difference, yo. I'm starting to notice this at the pre-adolescent stage, right? Prison parties so, are popping so, when they get out. Oh man, the, the whole commute, the whole neighborhood yep. come out for the welcome home party. Yeah. Yep. But for the for the graduation party, it ain't that popping. No. Nope. So in my in my and and notice what I keep saying. I keep saying in my young impressionable mm -hmm. because young minds are very impressionable it's easy to impress a young kid's mind mm -hmm. it's easy to persuade it's easy to mold it so all i'm seeing is man when the guys come home from prison man it's like a wow mm -hmm. so when so when i'm at recess in in sixth grade and, and we and, and all the other kids they running playing soccer they playing grab ass with the girls nigga i'm over there playing thug mm -hmm. I'm talking about what kind of party I'm gonna have when I come home from prison, already. like so and so. So, yeah. I'm already, I'm also as I'm seeing that certain movies is starting to come out. So we, we're getting away from movies like House Party, Colors, we, we, Boys in the Hood, yeah, Menace to we Society. Got colors, boys. So, so these type of movies now are starting to come out, and it's being introduced to us in culture. Mm -hmm. So. When you say a badge of honor, it became a badge of honor, homie. Mm -hmm. And even right now today, as a 43-year-old man, I sometimes feel like I missed out on something by not going to prison. Huh. I feel like a nigga got the I feel like a nigga got the ups on me because he can always see a shit. Nigga, you ain't made it on such and such, y'all. Nigga, you couldn't have made it on. He got that on me. Huh. So it makes me feel less macho. Yeah, so so what I have so what I had to do, I had to go root my identities, homie, in, in, in something else that that didn't revolve it didn't have to do with a detriment, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fatherhood. Yeah. Most black men's identity is rooted in the bravado stripes of having to commit crimes, selling dope, or being in the streets. 
So I got that from childhood. So it wasn't nothing for me. It, it wasn't nothing for me when I got arrested, nigga, to, not to go. I didn't care about going to juvenile because I'm I'm getting my badge of honor. I'm getting my strike. Yeah, it's like freshman year in college or something. Say, say. So when I got the juvenile, when I first went to juvenile, my first time ever being arrested, uh, it was at an eighth eighth grade school dance, man. What uh, was that I'm for? showing out. I'm showing out in, in front of the school, man. Uh, and, and and I pick some I pick some uh, roses out of the garden that's around the flower pole. You know the school the school roses. Well. Because of my reputation and, and, and my behavior, my troubled behavior in school, they considered that a criminal mischief. Well, I'm talking smart. Well, my mom done moved us out of Stop Six. We done moved out of Fort Worth and we done moved to Arlington, right? We're in the suburbs now. Mm -hmm. But I'm in I'm in the suburbs, Holland Stop Six. I'm from the hood. I'm talking, I'm mimicking what I done heard other street men say that I done been around. Mm -hmm. So, nigga, they take me to juvenile for the weekend. And Friday night, I stay Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, once I got there and I realized you're not getting raped, I realized everything, the stereotypes that you believe doesn't really happen. The fear of going no longer exists. And you said something that I found interesting on one of your videos. You said whenever you would go, to you know jail juvenile hall or whatever the case is you you liked it because that was the only place where you felt you got love or you got some talking to oh uh, from a man yeah uh there, there there was men men big Al, and and anybody been through juvenile nigga kimbo road nigga mr brown <laughs> mr brown worked in the school uh big Al, ted tony uh say man uh uh, uh miss sanchez man it was so many uh I looked it forward to the affirmation uh, that I got. Right, mm -hmm. the longest the longest I was gonna stay was ten days. Uh, the, the 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 least twenty the least twenty four hours be out the next day. But just that just that just that contact, homie. Just that con. That's even though I had to get in trouble to get it. That's why a lot of kids don't give a damn about getting in trouble, nigga. Cause sometimes the negative attention. It's just as equal as receiving the positive attention because mm -hmm. oh, yeah. the next man get no attention. It's like a right? dog too. You yell at a dog, they do it more. You know what I'm saying? Do it yeah. more. more. Uh, so man, just being able to uh, go to juvenile detention and and, and 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 Mr. Brown saying, Charlie, what you done done this time? Pull me off to the side, man, and just being able to have that one on one time with that man. Damn. If it wasn't nothing but for ten minutes. Hmm. That's a cold situation, man. Think about that men out there who don't have, who aren't sticking around for their kids, dog. He, he felt love from a, uh, you know, what I'm saying another um, older man, not like that. But when he went to, you know, juvenile hall, dog, that that's so crazy to me, man. But but see, back then you got to think, homie. This is this is early '90s, '90, 90, '91. Mm -hmm. So the, the 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 there's no really such thing as children committing murders. It, that that hadn't come about yet. And and, and and America still believes uh, that they can have great impacts on children. Uh, it was still spirit of people who, even our teachers back then, homie, it was still people who poured uh, their, their whole entire lives in, in, in the working with children, and, and they was barely making it. Yeah. But you see what I'm saying? And so I, I got to be exposed to them kind of people. I got to, I got to be exposed to people who would stand up against their employers when they done wrong against a kid. So I landed, I landed in trouble during a great time in America. Uh, I was, I was blessed to, to, to land be in that era during that time when people really believed children could change. On the line. I have a West Coast veteran. It actually came right to my house. And, you know, I had to go away for a little while. It was like two factions. It was uh, the Kelly Park Cribs, and it was like the KPH, which was the Kelly Park Hustler. Being MC Ram, we was like, we more a hustler. And when I heard Boys in the Hood, Easy E let me hear that personally. Take me back to that 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 day that you guys um, took that iconic picture. Yeah. But what do you remember about yeah. the whole uh, Ice Cube and NWA split? Did you ever meet Jerry Heller? Yeah, no, yeah, I know Jerry. Would you say he was more beneficial 
to NWA or less beneficial? Um, I mean, when I met Suge, Suge was uh, personal security for uh, the DOC. I didn't like the way that he, he was portrayed in the movie. Okay. Because he was so much more, you know, Ren didn't disappear at a club one day. You know, me and Ren was out, out doing the shit that, that Q was rapping about. But at 14, you caught a murder case, and you were one of the first, if not the, the first child in, in, explain that whole situation, the first chi child of uh, tried as man, man, I, uh, Let me see. Prior, prior to me, let me see, me, Jose Rodriguez, Anthony Lightfoot, Marquette Bush, and, uh, and man, when I got to getting state school, I don't recall any other kid coming from Fort Worth, Texas, uh, who had gone to getting state school for murder. Uh, my one of my good friends, Jose Rodriguez, he's one of the first children in Fort Worth, Texas, to receive a 30-year sentence for murder. Ooh. So I could we, we was charged with capital murder on September 18, 1991. Jose came in probably four or five days after that. They killed the neighborhood crime watch guy. Uh Anthony Lightfoot came in with a with two attempted uh capital murders. There were other guys, there was other children who was in juvenile detention center at the time, guys like Sessed, uh, Derek Williams, uh, uh, Lil Rank, uh, man, there, there were other guys who had committed murder, but they had got tried as adults. So myself, Jose Rodriguez, uh, 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 George, uh, uh, George Ramirez, George got 25 years, Jose got 30, I got 12, uh, Josh Henry, uh, they was the skinheads who killed this black guy who worked at General Motors, a real, real big case. So we were the first children uh, in Tarrant County uh, to be what they call adjudicated. There's a difference bet between uh, and, uh, when a juvenile commits murder, when a juvenile commits robbery, all of juvenile crimes are considered family court involvement. So no matter what a juvenile does, their case remains in family court compared to an adult when an adult does something wrong they're in criminal court so the terminology that's used for a juvenile is adjudication so that's why you hear some people in adult court deferred deferred adjudicated right so that there's stipulation to adjudication a child is adjudicated they cannot be convicted a, a adult is convicted they can be adjudicated in certain circumstances mm -hmm. Right, so we are the first children to be tried, sentenced, and adjudicated uh, for the crimes of capital murder and murder. Uh, we're the first generation of children in the state of Texas who began to commit these crimes where Texas had to create a juvenile law where a kid in the state of Texas who commit violent crimes can be sentenced up to 40 years. Damn, so a 12 year old can get 40 years or a 13 year old can get 40 years and so i fall under the generation of children where that law was created let me ask um, you let me ask you a quick question um so up until then you know it was a badge of honor to you know go to jail in and out of juvie hall and all that when you heard you were getting 12 years did you still have that feeling or were you like god damn i fucked up well uh It's hard, it's hard to answer that question. Uh, a, as a child, you don't know you fucked up. You know you know you done something wrong, and, and, and you know the, the feelings that, that you feel. There's no way for a kid to understand I killed somebody. Okay, that makes a lot there's of sense. Brain, there, there's mm -hmm. brain development, right? Yeah. All, all the science data, all the medical research has proven, has shown that the human brain does not develop to or at around age 25. That's why your insurance rates don't go down to after 25, right? So everybody has this data. So when you look at a 13 year old kid and you say, man, what the fuck you do that for? And they say, I don't know. They really don't. They, because the, the front of the brain, right? There's a, there's a part of the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex doesn't connect right until 25 26 27 and that depends on the your your traumatic life experiences if you've been abused if a nigga a nigga been abused his brain might not develop till he's 30. yeah so 
months or later, right? So the prefrontal cortex is the part of the front part of your brain that has to do with logic and reasoning, decision making. Until until that develops and connects, most children are kind of like animals. They're impulsive. They make decisions off impulse, what they feel. Mm -hmm. That's why most ad you see what I'm saying. So that's why children are so impulsive. So once when I when I committed my crime, uh, society didn't have that data it, because we had never started committing those type of crimes before. When I when I committed my crime. Hillary Clinton had just made a bold statement throughout America that sent a shockwave of fear through America, right? She said that there was going to be a wave of children that's born, that they was going to be super predators, that they was going to mm, be I remember that. Bigger, yeah. faster. She said that they was going to be stronger that. criminals. Shit. Yeah. And so what happened when she said that, now here you got children starting to commit murder. So, wow, that sent a shockwave of fear. And not only did it scare white people, it scared black people, too. That's why Maxine Waters and Sheila Jackson and all and, and Reverend Jesse Jackson, all of those people aligned with Bill Clinton with the three strikes minimum. And the, and the Democratic Black Caucus went with the three strike minimum, mandatory minimum law. They fucked us over with the mass incarceration mm -hmm. because they thought what Hillary Clinton said was true. Man... Yeah. Which makes me shocked that still what ninety percent of us vote Democrat. But hey, that's a whole yeah, other man, story. That's, that's, that's a whole other story. A whole, yeah, we'll that's, get into that next time we talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 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 a whole other story. And so with that brain development, man, to answer your question, I remember telling my mother, I wanted to go do six months. My brother had done six months. I wanted to go do nine months because back then. The juvenile facilities, some of them was co-edited, so they had boys and girls in there. And, and, and you got you got weekend furloughs, you got to wear your own clothes. So I wanted to go for three months. Plus, I had failed, to eight, I had flunked the eighth grade. And one thing I knew about the Texas Youth Commission, once you went through to the Youth Commission, when you got out, they put you in your right grade. So I wanted to go somewhere, homie. Don't get it. I wanted to go because I wanted the welcome home party. Remember? Mm-hmm. I just didn't think that I would be gone forever. As a kid, you mm. can't wrap your mind around that. Mm. So I heard, I hear them saying 40 years, but in my mind, man, they ain't gonna get no kid no 40 years. I've been listening to them old niggas, man. They gonna slap you on the wrist. So then when I get to 12 and they had sat me down and got me to understand what was gonna happen. Okay, you got 12 years. You're going to have to do at least four years before you can come back and see the judge before they can decide whether you go home or you be transferred to prison. Well, to a 14-year-old kid, homie, I'm in the eighth grade, right? Supposed to be in the ninth. Mm -hmm. You telling me I got to spend my whole motherfucking high school career somewhere? A, a freshman can't think of what he going to do when he's a senior. That yeah. seemed like a yeah. lifetime. So when they told me that, I couldn't wrap my mind around four years. I broke down and told mama, man, I broke down crying. Mm. Now I ain't tough, nigga. Mm. Now I done broke, I'm a kid now. Because mm. y'all trying to get me to understand something, man. Mm. I, I couldn't understand what we had done. I really didn't have no remorse. I just know what we done were wrong. But I, I felt like, man, he didn't have no business doing what he, so I couldn't process the shit, right? Mm -hmm. So I tell mama, man, mama, I can do two years, but I can't do four years. And man, that woman looked at me with all the strength she could muster up and looked me directly in my eyes and said, son, you ain't got no choice. Mm. What you gonna do, kill yourself? Mm. You ain't got no choice but to do it, son. You did it. And so, man, in my mind, I can't process this. Mm -hmm. So you become, you, you, you take on what any other kid would take on, man. You become depressed. Uh, you, you 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 take on physical sickness. You start throwing up. You can't eat, man, because you got to leave your. You got to go away, and you don't know what you're going to. Mm. You don't know. You don't have no idea what's ahead. It's like the message has been lost. How much money does a black life cost? 
Every time we kill another brother, we keeping people employed who profit when we kill another. Bang, bang. How can we make a change instead of pointing at others for the blame? Shit, let's put some gasoline on the flame and burn this bitch down if they don't hear what we saying. Bang, bang. Better be strapped for the peace. They talking about defunding police. Gun stores sold out for six weeks. I'm smelling something in the air and it reeks. Black lives matter all the time. Not just when one of them kills one of our kind. Cause I don't ever see Al Sharpton speaking when Chicago has 30 murders in one week. Oh, yeah. 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 Come on. Hey, hey, hey. Pay attention, maybe slow down and just listen It's my state of mind, I'm dreaming, I'm on a mission Trying to push the world for peace, no more hate I got my black fist up in the corner to demonstrate Let's get it straight this time, movement is all over the world Energy divine, where were you when the revolution got started? Black people fed up, more than daily departed We all living on this earth, we human, nobody rally Marching in units in George Floyd, chanting loudly how many brothers have to die? We already realize equality's a lie. I'm trying to get it by any means that be necessary. Red and blue lights flashing behind me can't be very scary. I see the police before they see me. Get out the car, roll the ground down on your knees. Please. The pigmentation of my skin, this current situation Got me feeling like the revolution's about to begin On the different type of vibes, so many ready for change Fist in the atmosphere, sick and tired of the games Being played, body slain, ain't no fucks given Only justification is I fit the description Trapped in the system, just another digit In their private prison, trying to keep the optimism It's tearing me to the core, how many more we gon' lose? We got the right to live our life without you and me Know what we do, enlighten the youth Feed the knowledge, give them tools Running the race, coming out of my shoe Taking it all the way back to my it's a different time, we ain't going forward You see there's power in numbers, keep on ignoring You see us coming together, together we growing They feel the changing is coming, you better know I'm angry at 31, you angry at 16 I'm angry at when we go Listen to his story. He he grew up in in you know the the worst the worst of the worst situations that a lot of us grow up to. But um, I want to lay this on my audience right now because after hearing this man's voice and his hearing his story, you would never think that he walks around with a "Make America Great Again" hat. Right? You are you man. are yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh. I, I I don't know what other time nobody else done lived in. Mm-hmm. Break it down. But I was I was born in 1977. I ain't never seen a black person hang from a tree. Break it down. I once I once saw the Ku Klux Klan in 1986, but we was in Monroe, Louisiana, and they was doing a march, and I ain't hear them scream the word nigga. I killed a white man. We I went to jail for killing a white man, homie. Something most niggas have never done or never even think about doing. I went inside an institution bragging about it. I had a white governor. I had a white judge. I had a white lawyer. I had a white prosecutor. Uh, and I got to see compassion. I had a white victim's family. 
I had white people, man. We killed that man and didn't have no remorse for it, man. And when I went back at 18 years old, man, them white people looked at me with tears in their eyes and say, man, we forgive you. Man, I know some, I know some niggas, if you walk through their grass, nigga, they won't forgive you. Mm-hmm. Let alone if you kill one of their family members. I remember in 1980, man, when you could, you can give, you can put beer in a baby's bottle and you didn't have to worry about CPS knocking on your door. Whiskey if you had a toothache. Say, man, I remember in the 1980 when two black people fought, it was, it was almost unimaginable to see you stomp and kick on another black man laying on the ground. Mm. I remember black people used to celebrate Juneteenth in the 1980. We got new clothes, man. I remember we had family reunions often in the 1980s, man. I remember black people used to have to be home by supper time and sit at the table and you used to have to say, can you pass me the potatoes? And y'all had to pass the tape. I remember, homie, when black people didn't shoot up each other's houses. I remember drive-by was unheard of in the black families. I remember when black people used to fight, homie, they used to have to literally kiss and make up or they got their ass whooped. Man, I remember on Sundays, homie, in, in many black households, it was meals somewhere. I remember in the 80s, homie, when people got off on crack and ran off and left their children, anybody raised them. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Anybody raised them. They didn't mistreat them mm. or none of that, homie. Yeah. I remember them days. Now, if you can think back farther than that, when they used to kick a nigga in the ass, then you got every right to kind of say you don't remember when it was great, homie. I remember when you can commit a crime, my nigga, like murder, and they'll give you a second chance to redeem yourself at life. Mm. Break it down, dog. I remember, homie. I remember when school teachers was a lot older, and they didn't dress sexy, and you didn't fuck your teachers. Nigga, they really, they would come home and tell you, man, they would come home to teach you. Man, I remember it was used to be candy ladies in our community. Oh, yeah, everybody had a candy lady. Say, man, I remember, homie, when your neighbor could whoop your child. And it was understood that you didn't whoop that child for nothing. And when that child came home, they got another whooping. I remember when we when sagging first came, homie. And we were sagging our pants and grown folks would ride down the street and haul out. Pull them goddamn pants up and all those, but just pull them up. Don't know who we just know a grown person <laughs> said. I remember, homie. So I wore that hat with pride, my nigga. I remember in the 80s, homie, black people was making, I mean, black people was, was thriving. Even if they put crack in our communities, they didn't make us pick it up. Okay. Yep. We had some people that didn't touch it. We had some people didn't fool with it. Even though it was put there, even though that pausing is put on your table, we had some people didn't touch it because they knew it was pausing. Mm. So if I give you pausing and you know it's pausing, I ain't wrong. Mm-hmm. It's your choice to so, take that. So, man... That's what I mean by I remember. And can't nobody else not make me remember those days, homie. The 1980s. Damn, what a good time that was. Hey, man, for real. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm your age, my man. I remember like it was yesterday, and it was a really good time. Even though I was too young to even really understand what was going on, it just it felt great, and to this day it feels great. And, yeah, that's why I wanted to let my audience know, man, this dude, um, you know what I'm saying, he's all, all um, you know, black folks who are on the right, they, they don't all have a, the same story. I mean, this motherfucker grew up right next to you guys, and he decided to, to you know what I'm saying, go a different route and not follow, you know, the rest of, of the, the, the sheep, I would say. But I want to... And guess what, homie, I, and, and I don't mean to cut you off, nah. and, and I'm not the hood nigga. I'm the nigga who mother, I'm the traditional, I'm the typical traditional child who comes from the single parent home that comes out the middle class, upper middle class neighborhood that has the single mom who worked to provide the kids with all the name brand stuff, but he want to go back to the hood and the ghetto and act like his ghetto cousins who wish they could have what he have. 
I'm the I'm the unappreciative kid whose mother works hard to make it out the ghetto, and I put all that pressure on mama trying to act like those images because I never had that man. Mm. Yeah, man, that's so important. And all I'm going to say to to end this is Charleston White 2024. We need you on the card, man. I hope you are at least <laughs> thinking of doing something locally. You know what I'm saying? Because the real talk, we need more people of color in in, in going into politics. Um, it's I'm the, really, I'm the really election, important. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the election judge for every election cycle for the Tarrant County Republican Party. Uh, I've been nominated uh to be a precinct chair which is an elected position where my name will be on the ballot uh so man uh I, i'm a I, I i'm a i'm a conservative nigga <laughs> i like just that. so happens i need Listen a shirt to me. I'm, a con- I'm a conservative nigga who just so happens to vote republican because the republican platform kind of embraces my conservative values that muddy and them taught out that bomb that's what's up, dude. That's what's up. And hopefully I can have you on again and we can we can go more onto the political side closer to November. Anytime, brother. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Um, please uh, let everyone know where they can follow you. Oh, uh, man, follow me on Instagram, white underscore Charleston. Uh, check me out on YouTube, Charleston White, Uncle Tom Management. Or uh, follow me on my 13 Facebook pages, man, Charleston White. You go and do it. You must get you <laughs> must get flagged. I got an album coming out, too, uh, man. I got an album dropping on, on, on Juneteenth, man, June 19th. The name of the album is called We Are Fucked Up as a Race of People. Oh, damn. Okay. Nice, man. Make sure you guys check my dude out, and we'll have you on uh, in the future. Charleston White, everybody. Thank you, man. Have a great night. All right. God bless, brother. Peace, Doc. Yes, sir. On the line, we have Lydia. It'd be like drama on the play. Like, I got shot at my oh, first man. night. She's like, give me a gun, daddy. What's the difference between having a pimp and not having a pimp? He's like your mentor. He teaches you the game. And um, basically, he gives you guidance. I left him because he was a gorilla. A gorilla pimp. Me, beating me. I can't go home Long Island because I'll get killed. <laughs> Take us back to the night that you um, that you turned your first trick. So, what's um like one of the craziest things that you've seen walking the blade? Mm-hmm. He pulled a gun on you. Yeah, I'm like I don't even have nothing. I ran into traffic. You were recently considering committing suicide. I got raped by a trick bike. He went for he went for free head. Ladies and gentlemen, DJ Domino. What up, DJ Domino? If it wasn't for this, that the little wicked wicked book of book of sounds and all that, you know. I might have gangbanged. Yeah. There was a couple of places where we did have to shut down because there was a body outside. What do you remember about when crack cocaine hit the streets? I was dub C beatboxer. Do you remember if he was banging back then? Because apparently he was he was he was a real, you know, real street dude at one oh, point. Oh yeah, yes, definitely. What do you remember about Rodney and Joe Cooley coming together? What do you remember about the peace treaty? Bailed out the guard, seen blue and red everywhere. Look how strong we are. You um kinda did something and, you know, got all the bloods and the crips together. Only a very cult following type of people remember N O. T-S. This might be an exclusive <laughs> on your show. 